Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Usborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension. And we are happy to share with you today's webinar entitled TikTok, a timely update on ticks, diseases, and prevention, presented by Dr. Timothy McDermott, Ohio State University educator. This is an update from the 2019 EAB University tick disease webinar that he gave. Dr. McDermott has been an Ohio State University Extension educator for the past five years after 22 years in private practice, veterinary medicine, and surgery. He has lectured on ticks and the diseases they vector to multiple audiences, including the Nature Conservancy, the Ohio Division of Forestry, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, Ohio University, Glattfelter Corporation, American Electric Power, and multiple county and regional health organizations. To our participants today, we welcome your questions and comments. Dr. McDermott will be answering questions in the chat pod during today's presentation, so please use that chat pod feature for both questions and comments today. Tomorrow, you will be mailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include our present presenters' contact information, as well as information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today, everyone, and Tim, please start your presentation. Thanks, Robin. Welcome, everybody. So as Robin was saying, uh, this is an update from last year's talk about ticks. We did a um, 2019 ones. And one of the things that I've noticed when I do um, outreach and engagement about ticks, and, and everything that I'm going to be talking about today is really based off some early needs assessments that I got from county client residents, because I'm a county educator. But they were really starving for um, some, some increased knowledge and, and where are we at with ticks and what diseases do they vector? And most importantly, how do I protect my family or my companion animals or my livestock from all these diseases that we're seeing? And we're seeing them really rapidly increase in number um, as well as we're seeing new ticks move into new ranges. So just a few fast facts. Ticks vector or transmit um, bacterial and viral diseases to companion animals, producers, and livestock, as well as they can cause an allergic syndrome if you um, have an immune reaction to certain carbohydrate components in their saliva. And these are rapidly developing and rapidly changing. I honestly change this presentation probably every two to three weeks as I get new data come over. We're gonna be talking about hard shell ticks today. We're gonna to keep it to the ones that are common to Ohio, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not coming uh, towards Indiana or that state up north, and we're gonna talk about that as well. And so a lot of times um, when you talk to folks, and, and myself included, I might misspeak and say insects when I'm talking about them, but ticks are actually arachnids. Um, they have a three life cycle stages they mature through, and at their uh, older two stages, they have four pair of legs, they hunt via questing. They use those four pair of legs in a uh, interesting way where they're going to feed and that is the back two pair of legs are holding on to the vegetation and the front two pair of legs grab their host as they walk by. So they don't really run fast and, and they don't jump and they don't fly. They're going to grab you as you walk by. And as I've been talking to a lot of audiences going forward, what I find is there is a lot of myths out there that we need to dispel with some knowledge so that we make sure that folks are protecting themselves. And one is the ticks are only active in summer. And quite honestly, it really uh, depends on the tick species and it depends on what life cycle that tick is within there. Most, uh, a lot of uh, ticks that we're, you know, talking about, they have a variable life stage and, and when they're going to be most present in the environment, depending on that life stage. A lot of the data we have that we'll talk about is really CDC data that is from the black-legged tick or the deer tick regarding Lyme disease. And then myth number two is ticks prefer the 
woods, uh, and a bunch do. A lot of folks think I'm only going to get ticks if I head into the woods, but there's a couple of species of ticks that they can tolerate open habitat and actually have some preferences for some open habitats such as pasture and fields. Uh, so you can have a, a, an encounter with a tick pretty much about anywhere outdoors you're going to go. And the other uh, myth that I commonly get um, questions about is, is, you know, how long does it take once a tick is on me embedded in feeding before that disease is going to be vectored to me? And it's, you know, it was always common, at least when I was in practice, that we thought we had a day in order to make sure that we could kill that tick with an acaricide on a dog or a cat. Um, but as we are finding when more research comes out, uh, that is not true. Uh, it really depends on the tick species, the life cycle of that tick, and what disease we're talking about. So here is a deer tick. And um, like I said, a lot of the data that we have is CDC driven um, deer tick. Uh, or black-legged tick regarding Lyme disease. And this is a tick that is much more active in spring, summer, or fall. And you can see that it takes uh, a couple of years to make its way all the way through their uh, maturation cycle. And, and that's not uncommon. You can have two, even three years for ticks to do that. And, and it can be delayed. If they don't have any food out, they are extraordinarily hardy at sort of stay in put in, staying in a hypobiotic state until they um, come out to feed. So, when we look at the different kind of weather patterns we get though, it's not uncommon, at least for me in central Ohio, for us to have extraordinarily uh, mild winters. Uh, last winter was an example of that. We really had a very mild winter. In fact, it seemed like it was almost colder in April or May than it was in November, December, or January. And um, we get a lot of anecdotal evidence that there are ticks that are out there moving around and feeding even in the really cold weather. Transmission is another one that we have lots of uh, data that we need to collect and a lot of research that we need to do because that data again is CDC data from Lyme disease transmission in adult deer ticks and they do find that it takes about 24 hours when it's on you embedded for you to have transmission of disease and there's sort of a linear correlation that the longer it's on you the larger your chance um, to contract the disease assuming the tick is carrying it while it's feeding but there is some indications in some research papers that I've seen and some of the data that's out there that once you start looking at different ticks or once you start looking at different diseases or once you start looking at different life stages, whether that's a nymphal or a larval, you can have a much faster transmission time. And in fact, um, they're postulating that anaplasmosis can take as little as 12 hours needed to transmit. Um, I read a research paper about Powassan virus where in mice in the laboratory, it was transmitted in as little as 15 minutes um, from nymphal deer ticks. And then uh, I read recently an interesting article about transmission for Rocky Mountain spotted fever that stated that they were finding the um, causative organism for that in the salivary glands of ticks and that transmission was very close to immediate that once that tick is on there and that hypostome which is pictured in that illustration at the bottom right of the slide uh, gets inserted into the host and they start feeding um, that that organism can be vectored pretty quickly. So those are some of the myths that when you are out there talking to your clients or, or you are doing public awareness, you're going to get lots of questions about um, because we simply don't have the amount of data that we need, plus we need to match that with outreach. And if you're looking uh, to fill some extra free time, you will find uh, that there is a welcome audience out there that wants to learn a lot more about ticks, the diseases they vectors, and um, what you can do to protect yourself from them. So we're gonna talk about ticks in Ohio now, and, and those ticks in Ohio, if they're not already in your state, they're coming and they will be there soon. Um, Last year in the 2019 presentation that I did, if you take a look, I talk about Gulf Coast and I talk about Longhorn Tick and I talk about they're not in Ohio yet, but I uh, was betting that they would be here this year and they are here this year. So there are um, migrations of ticks and they are expanding their hosts, uh, host ranges, um, and they are kind of moving where they can find their food. So common ticks in Ohio, Brown dog tick, American dog tick, black legged tick or the deer tick, lone star tick, Gulf Coast tick, and longhorn tick. And they come in variable shapes and sizes. And when you look at this illustration, the thing that really is striking is all the way at the far left, and that is the black legged tick, it's nymph. And, you know, 
ticks aren't giant creatures until they start to feed and then once engorged they can be huge but when you really have some worries about ticks, you know, when you do a tick check on yourself and you are trying to find where there would be one walking on you or you're doing a tick check on livestock or doing a tick check on a dog or a cat, it, it can be difficult to spot an adult tick. It can be downright um, impossible to find a larval or an infill tick. So that's some variation of sizes and that is a very brave person to line those ticks up like that on their finger. So the American dog tick's been around for a long time. And when I first started in private practice, this is the one that we had on our uh, critters when they came in. Pretty much the only one that we had other than the brown dog tick. This is um, a vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, all ticks vector multiple diseases to their hosts. Not every tick vectors every disease to their host. They all kind of have their favorites that they do and the ones that they're known for. Um, this is another one where when we talk about where its habitat is uh, preferential, you are more likely to find this guy in a little more open habitat. It's a little more tolerant of sunlight. Uh, this is one that I would say super common to find in pastures or meadows, um, open grasslands. Last two ticks I had on me, uh, well actually two of the last three, the last one I had on me was a deer tick. That was when I was doing a tick drag, so I was asking for that. But the last two that I had on me when I was not really expecting ticks were both in lawns here in central Ohio. They were both American dog ticks. So we got somebody pop up there. To moderator, will this program be archived or accessed later? Yes, this is uh, being recorded and it will be posted on the EABU YouTube channel. So there's the American dog tick. Been around for a long, long time. It's distribution, and I want everybody to take a very close look at this distribution map, especially this eastern half of the United States. Cuts down um, about halfway through, uh, and this is the distribution map for the American dog tick, plus there's a little bit of some coastal um, west coast over here on there. Rocky Mountain spotted fever common, tularemia uh, is another one that it can uh, vector to hosts. So the black-legged tick has been here in Ohio for a while now. It really only started to be common in Ohio in about the last 10 to 15 years. In fact, when I was in private practice, and this is about 10 years ago, we were approached by one of the vaccine companies uh, to see if we wanted to carry their Lyme vaccine. And they asked us how much uh, Lyme disease that we see in practice. And, and we said we didn't really see very much of it in practice, if any at all. And the nice thing about veterinary medicine is we, we have great tests for a lot of these tick vector diseases. We can test very rapidly for Lyme disease or Ehrlichia or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, and, but at the time, we really weren't doing a lot of that testing because we weren't finding those ticks. So that company paid for a Lyme test on uh, every dog that came in for a heartworm blood draw. Uh, and they, and when we collected all the data 10, 15 years ago, we had zero cases. Fast forward to now and, um, and the black legged tick and Lyme disease is all over Ohio, mostly on the wooded part of Ohio, which is our east and our southern, sort of um, away from our corn belt. But it's been found in the majority of Ohio counties now and um, and it is here and it, it followed an interesting pattern, right? So Lyme disease is named for Lyme, Connecticut and and this was our Ohio from 2014. It was really found, um, in fact, they, they found big clusters over here on this part uh, in Coshocton County and it was sort of in the upper Midwest here and, and if you're familiar with Ohio, really the band of Ohio uh, in this spot right here is more of our agronomic crop producing area and the black-legged tick is a woodland tick and like its uh, namesake, it is uh, preferentially feeds on deer. Its diseases, anaplasmosis, um, Babesia, Borrelia um, diseases, which are the one, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, and then Powassan encephalitis. Um, we go to just five years later, here is our um, black legged tick and this is CDC host range. You will notice that if we compare this graphic to that American dog tick graphic, we have very, very similar host range. Now we don't have a coastal um, black legged tick uh, uh, host population over here, but they do have a Pacific deer tick and, and they do have Lyme or they do have Borreliosis over there from that one. 
So when we look at Lyme disease, and quite honestly, this is really um, a disease that when you go out and do outreach or you start talking to your client residents, I have found that in pretty much almost every talk that I ever give, there's somebody, if not multiple people in that audience where either they personally or they had a family member that was um, impacted by tick diseases. One of the things that's troubling to me, at least anecdotally, um, a lot of the disease that I have been hearing about, especially from um, colleagues of mine in extension who have been personally affected by this, it seems like um, the Lyme that I am seeing, at least in Ohio, is really closer to that Lyme encephalitis as opposed to the sort of arthritic components um, that I saw much earlier in my career. Here is a map of Ohio, and this is 2019 cases. I can tell you that it's very much underreported. The CDC estimates that we are getting about 10% of the actual cases reported. And so we have 30,000 to 40,000 cases reported annually of Lyme diseases. And the CDC's guesstimate is that we are underrepresenting and it's 10 times greater than that, 300,000 to 400,000 cases estimated per year. Here is the range of positives, but these are voluntary reported here in all the counties in Ohio, and you can see that it's really pretty much uh, in that wooded band that we have right here. Um, these counties that might not have a green dot in them, they're, they're going to have Lyme disease present, they're going to have deer. Um, interesting is, is when we looked at the total numbers of these, the total number of cases in 2019 reported was 220, but I did a program over in Belmont County, which is right here, right on the border, and, and there's lots of cases in Belmont County, but I did that uh, talk in partnership with Belmont County Public Health and one of the phys physicians in their hospital there, and he told me that he personally knew of 100 positive cases. So it is definitely under um, reported. You know, the problem is, is we don't have excellent, really rapid, uh, inexpensive testing in humans for a lot of these tick vector diseases yet. I've seen some research that there are companies working on that. And I think that when we're able to test quickly, like a strep test or something like that, uh, we're going to find that we have a lot more uh, disease out there than we think we have, and that should improve our reporting and hopefully improve uh, our outreach as well. So the Lone Star Tick. The Lone Star Tick is in Ohio. It's probably been here for the last five or 10 years. It, um, it is one that when I go down into Southern Ohio, especially in the summer, doing a tick drag, maybe walking around looking, trying to collect some samples. This is commonly all I will find. These guys are very aggressive feeders of about anything, including humans. Um, they are in large numbers down there. This is um, a Lone Star Ticks range, and this is probably 2018 or 2019 CDC. I'm pretty sure that it is extended further now up into the upper Midwest up here. Um, you'll notice that at least as it's growing and spreading up north, it is starting to follow that exact same edge pattern of host range spread that we saw in the American dog tick earlier and we see in the black legged tick now. And my guess would be if it's not already there, it's gonna do that same exact pattern where it's gonna fill all of this up here and stop at whatever this invisible barrier to ticks is um, about halfway across the country. So I don't have a slide that lists some of the diseases of this guy here. Um, it can vector any number of different diseases. Uh, the, the one that really gets people's attention and quite honestly got my attention uh, when I first learned about it, and I first learned about it actually from a person that had this allergic syndrome. So I was at a, um, I was at a dinner with uh, drug reps and they had invited all the doctors in our practice, and this was probably six years ago, and we were at a steak joint, and the gentleman sitting next to me ordered the fish, which everybody thought was unusual in a steak joint, and when we asked him about it, he reported that he had um, the alpha-gal or mammalian muscle allergy that resulted from a lone star tick bite. And that was the first that I had heard about that. But there is a component, uh, the alpha-gal component, um, which is a carbohydrate present in the saliva of this tick. 
that if your immune system reacts negatively to that, you can become allergic to non-primate mammalian muscle. Uh, and for me personally, that would be devastating because I love me my non-primate mammalian muscle. Uh, a bacon cheeseburger is probably my favorite thing to eat. Now, the problem uh, that we have besides that just being a devastating disease that can negatively affect somebody's life for a long time is here in Ohio, the Lone Star Ticks really range that they are thick in is actually where we have the majority of our cattle grazing, right in that band of Ohio, where if we go back to the, the um, the slide for Lyme disease. This is sort of the Appalachian band right here where we have uh, some grasslands and we do a lot of grazing up through um, Licking County all the way up uh, towards the lake. And that is the area in Ohio where we have the most Lone Star Tick. So these are where cattle producers um, do the majority of their work and this is where they live and this is where they are going to have the most potential exposure to this. In fact, I was uh, doing a similar presentation to this at a um, commercial pesticide applicator training program about a year or two ago and one of the attendees came up um, from Gallia County. And we're gonna talk about Gallia County here in a little bit um, for another reason. But he had reported that there was multiple members of the Gallia County Cattlemen's Association that had contracted um, this disease. And, and, and that would be devastating uh, for that family to have an allergy to the very product that you are producing uh, for your livelihood. And so, um, you know, this really turns heads. When you are doing outreach and education about ticks and you talk about, you know, all the various diseases that they can vector, which are all universally devastating, um, you throw in an allergic syndrome to beef, pork, venison, lamb to that, um, and you'll find that you really get the attention of a lot of folks uh, that, um, that they really want to learn how they can make sure that does not happen to them. So let's talk about this guy right here, the Gulf Coast Tick. Um, the Gulf Coast Tick, if you'll notice, boy, it has really similar coloration to the American Dog Tick, but it's in the similar family, uh, or genus, I'm sorry, as the Lone Star Tick. This is one, it has been around for a long time and um, it has a long history. So it's not an invasive because this has been around in the United States for quite some time. Uh, in fact, it was first discovered and talked about by a researcher uh, named Koch in, back in 1844. And for anybody who is uh, familiar either with the history of the screw worm or maybe um, you are a long time cattle producer, back at the turn, uh, you know, around the 1900s, Screw worm was an absolutely devastating um, disease that was affecting basically any cattle, even companion animals. Um, the screw worm is a larval, um, uh, a larval form from a fly, uh, cochleoma, and screw worm differs from other fly maggots in that it doesn't just feed on dead tissue like a lot of uh, maggots do the screwworm larvae actually feeds on living tissue. And so when it gets into a host, and what it did at the time is, it was absolutely devastating to the livestock industry at the time because you would get wounds from any number of things. And that could be from normal things like castrating or dehorning or ear tagging. Or, and, and once that fly gets in there, those larvae can burrow into the animals causing uh, extensive lesions, extensive loss of muscle, damage to the hide. But if it burrows in far enough or you have a large enough burden for that, I mean, it can even progress to death where the Gulf Coast tick um, really impact that in just a horribly negative way is, just like its name, it is thick and that is its original host range in the United States, that Gulf Coast band, and we'll look at a map here in a second. It has a giant hypostome on it. So when you look at the mouth parts right here, this is a large feeding mouth part that goes piercing in there. And once it is feeding and it is injected all the various substances that it needs to feed, that it needs to make sure that it's cemented on the host, anticoagulants so um, that it can feed uninterrupted for a week or so, it leaves a prominent wound in fact, 
this one uh, leaves a large eschar or, or like a sort of a, a uh, eroded ulcerative area once it's done feeding on the host. And so this was a prominent uh, sort of supporter, I would say, of the original screw worm infestations that occurred in, in Texas and along that southern border back then. And, and this was so devastating into the livestock industry that the United States government went um, and developed a whole program for the eradication of screw worm um, for anybody, you know, and in fact, it's been gone for a while. Although if, uh, if you follow the news, two, three years ago, there was an outbreak in the Florida Keys around um, Big Pine Key. And they, they figure that maybe a screw worm larvae uh, or a fly had come um, you know, from somebody traveling to the Keys from, uh, because there is an international airport there. Uh, maybe it came in on a pet or something like that. Um, and th there was pros and cons of it landing in the Florida Keys. And one of the pros was you know, the Florida Keys are accessed by one road, USA-1A. So they were able to put up roadblocks to try to minimize this spread. And while it did make it off of the Keys and onto southern mainland Florida, they were able to get this screw worm under control. The negative for this was um, the outbreaks hotspot was on Big Pine Key, which is the natural habitat of an already endangered species, which is um, uh, the, the, um, the key deer. And so unfortunately, there was a number of key deer lost to screw worm uh, infection it, when this outbreak occurred. So it um, transmits any number of diseases. Some are native and have been found here in the America and the United States, but, but some are not. Um, in terms of what it can transmit to humans, the, uh, we worry about Rickettsia parkeri, which is a spotted fever disease, similar to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is Rickettsia rickettsii, um, generally not as virulent as Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but is one of the spotted fever diseases. And so this already does have an established disease that it can vector to humans. Um, in terms of what it would vector to uh, livestock, we're not seeing a tremendous right, uh, amount right now uh, of worry in terms of livestock. Heartwater is not currently present in the United States. Um, it does have the canine disease that it can transmit. A worry would be that uh, in the laboratory, experimentally, this is this um, this tick has been shown that it can vector leptospirosis, and leptospirosis is an entirely other uh, animal altogether. Meaning that lepto is a zoonotic disease, and it can cause serious uh, renal. Um, compromise and progress to death in terms of how it can affect your kidneys if you would be affected by leptospirosis. It's one of the diseases that we vaccinate companion animals for, um, canines. It's also um, in small ruminant vaccine protocols and cattle vaccine protocols. The problem with it is because it's a zoonotic disease and it's commonly spread uh, when, it, when it's in a host to other hosts through urine or feces, um, if the Gulf Coast tick gets a hold of leptospirosis and then vectors that to say cattle, then the producer working their cattle don't need to get that disease from the tick any longer because they can have that being shed by their cattle. And for anyone who's familiar with how cattle are raised, it is not uncommon whatsoever if they're urinating or defecating out in the pasture and they would roll around in it that they might be in contact with that, where a producer can then come in contact with this organism um, and become ill. Similar to should it be vectored into a dog um, when they're outside and you are coming in contact with, um, with dog feces or urine. Um, I did have a colleague in private practice that contracted lepto Leptospirosis in the um, course of just working her job uh, and had to be hospitalized for it. And so that is where I have some tremendous worries is um, what is this um, tick going to do uh, as it expands its host range? This has um, a very similar habitat range as the American dog tick. If you think about it, Gulf Coast, there's a little bit more heat down there. This um, tick can tolerate uh, a little bit more heat, a little less humidity needs than some of the other ticks. It does have a little bit more of a preference for say open areas or meadows or pasture. So this is gonna be one that we're gonna see potentially feeding on livestock um, or people when they're out. Um, 
uh, engaging it. And so this is the 2010 uh, Gulf Coast tick distribution in yellow from the CDC. And like you see here, it basically has a preference for the Gulf Coast. Now, you'll notice that there's an extension of this yellow that kind of moves up towards Arkansas, Oklahoma. And what that is, is there was shipments of cattle that came out of the Gulf Coast area that went up into this grazing area in the 70s or 80s. And those shipments um, did have Gulf Coast ticks on them. And this is a very opportunistic tick in terms of what it can do when it encounters new host ranges as long as food is there. Uh, and it, it colonized that area. And so even though this was not normally uh, its habitat range that it existed in, it had food, it liked the habitat when it was there, and it has expanded. And so what I've done is I've drawn this border on the slide, um, which now that I look at it suspiciously looks like a turtle that extends. Now they're finding Gulf Coast tick um, all the way up into New England and we have Gulf Coast tick now in Ohio and it is right here in the corner um, where the Ohio River meets the Ohio Indiana border. So for any of my Indiana colleagues on there um, I would be very suspicious that you might have some uh, present because it moved up right it sort of followed a pattern going up the Ohio River um, and and it would not surprise me if you guys had some Gulf Coast ticks present in Indiana right now uh, along some of your river counties. We found it in three counties in Ohio um, where there are established populations and that is Butler, Hamilton, and Claremont which basically makes this corner where the junction of Ohio, the Ohio River, and Indiana meet. So that is the first new tick that we're talking about in Ohio, the Gulf Coast tick. And my suspicion would be that if it is not already in Indiana, it will be there uh, shortly. And for those folks uh, in the state up north, I will probably give it another maybe couple few years before it makes it up there. The concern would be that it would have a very similar complete host range that we saw with the American dog tick, that we saw with the black legged or deer tick, and we're seeing, if not already there with the Lone Star tick, where it has that most of the East Coast um, habitat uh, colonized. So we talked about this last year and this is in the news and, and this was from the fall of 2017 where a producer in New Jersey working sheep uh, went into the barn to do some work on the animal and they found that the animal was crawling with ticks. And so they backed out and called their veterinarian because the ticks were starting to crawl all over the farmer. Veterinarian showed up, sees the animal crawling with ticks. Ticks are starting to crawl all over the vet, taking a look at it. They're not sure what it is. It's not acting um, like it would commonly act um, of any tick that they had seen before. They call the feds. Feds come in and they identify this as the Asian longhorn tick. And they um, question the farmer, they question the family. Nobody uh, anywhere around there, including the farmer or the animals or the neighbors had ever been to East Asia to where they could have brought this in. So what they did is they heavily treated the entire farm with permethrin in the fall when they came back in the spring, the ticket persisted and it was still there. It has started over the last few years with a very, very rapid spread um, out of New Jersey. And um, I think part of what is made it uh, difficult to uh, identify and track is it is not really distinguished by lots of unusual coloration patterns, right? So if you were to look back at the pictures we had of American dog tick and, and with the deer tick and the Lone Star tick with its prominent circle there and, and the Gulf Coast tick with its um, patternality, all of those ticks really have a showy um, pattern on them, whereas the Asian long longhorn tick just sort of has that muddy brown color. And in fact, if you looked at it uh, quickly, your guess is gonna be that that's a brown dog tick or, or any one of the ticks that can affect uh, wildlife that can look like that. And so when they started to go through some old samples in other places, um, they figure that it actually had first come in uh, at least best they could guess, maybe around 2010 to 2013 into the United States. Um, 
what I am seeing is their guess would be it came in on a dog that was um, in, uh, through international travel. How it got to New Jersey and how it colonized uh, that animal, I have not found um, any good explanation for how that happened. But this guy's spreading um, like wildfire. So here's our original New Jersey cluster and it has been moving its way. Um, basically what looks like following a lot of that sort of Appalachian uh, habitat. This one is not a huge feeder on humans, but it is uh, known to feed on a, a tremendous number of species, uh, including some birds, some small mammals, um, livestock, deer. And from that original one state, we now have it in 15. And so um, now when I look at this and we have it in Arkansas, um, that's worrisome to me. I don't know if that was found on a traveler or on an animal that maybe traveled over here because I'm not sure that we've really tracked um, sort of the contact tracing for a lot of these places on, in terms of where they came from when they had these ticks found. But one of the things that's really worrisome about this tick um, is is it's it just breeds like crazy and it has the ability to use parthenogenesis to breed. So parthenogenesis means that it the female does not need a male in order to um, lay her eggs and so she can spontaneously lay eggs and in fact when they tested the ticks that were on that sheep farm in Jersey originally they were all genetic clones of mama whichever the original mama was. I had mentioned Gallia County earlier. Gallia County is this green block right here that is on the um, Ohio River border uh, with West Virginia and Ohio. And that was where the first Asian longhorn tick was found in Ohio just this summer by uh, a colleague of mine, Marisa Pesipane, at, um, that she has a joint appointment at OSU with the College of Veterinary Medicine and um, College of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. She's in a project where she checks stray dogs out that, uh, or she checks out ticks that are submitted to her lab from stray dogs. And um, this one was found on a stray dog in Gallia County. So we are going to be trying to do some active surveillance for this tick now to find out where it's going and what it's doing in Ohio. Um, the, the, um, the modeling, however, you know, we've been talking about the modeling going forward and where can this tick live because it's not native. This is a true invasive. So the models that they look at are comparing the habitat and host range that it has in its native habitat to what we have environmentally here in the United States. And unfortunately, what we're finding is it looks eerily similar to all of those other ticks that we've been talking about in terms of where we worry it's going to end up. It almost looks exactly like an American dog um, our American dog tick model, the black-legged tick model, um, more like the American tick or American dog tick model because it does have that colonization of the coastal area over here on the west coast, but it's looking more and more like this is going to um, model like the other ticks we've been talking about and it's going to be an east coast one all the way to the middle of the country. All right, let's see. Uh, CEU information will be covered. Um, I think they're going to provide the links of uh, how to get CEUs, Sean, at the end of the presentation, or it will be in the follow-up uh, information that will be sent to you in the survey at the end. So, when we have an invasive tick and it comes here from um, places that are completely different than where it's at, we, we really the key thing that we want to find out is will it be able to vector any of the diseases that we have already present and um, what we found out at least initially is yes and we found that uh, originally this was found uh, and confirmed in West Virginia but it is able to transmit tyleria which is a uh, cattle disease that is similar to malaria and um, there have been some instances where this is transmitted tyleria to livestock the primary problem this causes in livestock that we've seen so far is it breeds on such tremendous numbers that it will actually cause anemia that can lead to death in cattle. This can, this can colonize an animal in such high numbers that there's so many ticks sucking blood off it that it can 
uh, cause profound anemia and even death in cattle where that is even magnified in a calf, which uh, doesn't have the ability to tolerate that. And because it is an invasive, we don't have any acaricides that have uh, uh, labels on there, right? And, and so basically, when you look at a label for any pesticide, acaricide, herbicide, fungicide, any of those things, the label is the law. You are required to read, understand, follow that label so that you are applying that pesticide um, in, in accordance with its use. So any use of acaricides to treat this tick have to be um, off-label or extra-label, I'm sorry, use from uh, a veterinarian to give guidance on that. And hopefully we will get some guidance on that coming up because uh, we are gonna need that. The way this breeds, the way this has a negative uh, potential impact on the livestock industry, not only in Ohio, but in the United States is very worrisome to me as a veterinarian who works closely with livestock producers. So here's a couple of fun pictures uh, in terms of how this tick can breed and then just cover. This is on a leaf margin uh, and these guys are looking to do some questing. They're going to hold on like you see with a back leg here. They're going to reach with some front legs and try to grab hosts as they go by. So what do you tell your clients? What do you, um, what do you want to do in order to prevent spread or transmission of this? Correct removal is key. And when I go out and talk to folks, I, I still um, hear folks that are talking about smothering it with kerosene or, or diesel fuel or uh, putting a cigarette out them, and that is not going to um, make anybody any healthier. You want to make sure that you use tweezers or, or um, sharp pointy tick tools because they make those now inexpensively. You need to get all the way at the um, head where it's embedded into the host. You don't want to just grab it by its butt and yank because you'll probably squeeze the gut contents in which is going to potentially expose to disease and or because this head is cemented on here pretty tight to withstand uh, the effects of gravity when it's engorged, if you don't get close to the head when you pull you might rip the abdomen off and you might leave the head parts in there. So grasp very close and firmly pull straight up. There's great stuff out there in terms of, of how, how you can protect yourself. Permethrin treated clothing is what I recommend. Almost every outfitter sells it now. You can purchase permethrin treated clothing from any number of places, Walmart, Tractor Supply, Columbia, REI, LL Bean, you name it, they all sell permethrin treated clothing. You can also self-treat, make sure that you purchase a permethrin product that is labeled for use on fabric because permethrin has been around for ages. It is in every formulation imaginable. There are topical formulas, there are shampoos, um, there are sprays that are used on premises, and there are also sprays that are labeled for use on fabric. That's what you want to um, use. Couple that with a repellent. Um, permethrin is an insecticide slash acaricide that is on your clothing. Repellents are topically applied. Several out there um, that will be effective. You want to check the label because they come in different concentrations. Certain ones are labeled for use in children. Certain ones are not. So make sure you make wise choices that way. And then take homes from this. Uh, several take homes. Ticks diseases are prevention diseases. I like to say that it, it's sort of like wearing a seatbelt. You wear a seatbelt because you want to prevent devastating injury should you get into a car crash. You could leave a seatbelt off and you can trust the EMTs and the orthopedic surgeons to put you back together. I'm sure they'll do their best job, but ideally you want to prevent that devastating injury in the first place. Realize, especially when we have these mild winters and, and we're seeing the effect, effects of global climate change that our seasons are changing a little bit and ticks, depending on species, um, there's going to be larval, nymphal, or adult um, ticks in all four seasons, wherever you're at. And if you start following this closely and you get on some of these listservs that are out there, you're going to find that we learn new things about these ticks constantly. And if it was me and I was in Indiana or that state up north, I would be very closely watching the spread of both the Gulf Coast tick and the Asian longhorn tick because um, they are modeled to enter into those areas and um, be a headache for uh, you guys. If they're not already there, they're coming. Make sure you have a personal plan for your safety. You're using permethrin treated clothing. You have repellents. You're doing tick checks. Um, after you come out uh, from outdoors, 
get them off before they embed and start feeding. Um, and then you can save them, you can submit them to your extension uh, educator, they'll help you identify them. Public health uh, officials are getting better at that depending on where you're located at. Make sure your companion animals, your dogs and cats, are included in your personal plan for safety. There are great acaricides in companion animals, way better than we have for people and way better than we have for livestock. Um, I'm waiting for them to come out with the, the drops that I can put between my shoulder blades because tick diseases are not ones that you want to have in there. Uh, make sure that you familiarize yourself with the proper removal technique for that and realize that you can actually submit a tick for testing if you were to pull it off, say your dog or pull it off yourself or one of your kids that was engorged and you're worried uh, if there was disease present in that tick. Uh, there are places um, like Tick Report, which is University of Massachusetts laboratory that can test that tick for a fee um, for a lot of the diseases that we've been talking about today. Make sure that you consult your physician. Uh, if you have any worries whatsoever, that you might have been exposed to a tick vector disease. And if you want a great resource where you can do a tremendous amount of um, data collection and familiarizing yourself on ticks with great pictures to look at, how to treat your clothing uh, videos and things like that, I urge you to take a look at tickencounter.org, um, also university research based. That's the University of Rhode Island. It's an outstanding resource. Uh, I check it all the time. They have a tick spotters that actually goes over what ticks are most active in the time time of year in my area. And so this is a great resource if you want to take a look at it um, in order to kind of develop some of your own outreach materials to serve your own client residents. All right, let's pop up into the chat. Okay, great. Thanks, Robin. Are permethrin treated clothing known to affect pets cats especially? That's a great question because cats are extraordinarily sensitive and can be um, uh, affected by the toxicity of permethrin. So what, and I have a cat and I treated my own clothing and what I did is I made sure that I treated my clothing outdoors in my garage, nowhere near my cat. And I then brought uh, that clothing in after it was completely dried so there wouldn't be any uh, shed of the product. It bonds pretty well to the fabric when you use the fabric labeled one. Um, but I also make sure, because I treat my shoes as well and I waited till they're dry, but I also make sure that I am keeping those stored in a place where my cat can't get to, which is tricky because he likes to go to places he's not supposed to. Um, but what I've seen is if, if done properly, uh, you can uh, minimize potential toxic exposure to your cats. Um, could you explain how to best preserve a tick for testing? Alcohol freeze? Actually, none of those. Elizabeth, if you want to submit a tick for testing, basically from what I've read on there, you just put it in like a Ziploc bag and you send it in. Uh, you don't want to otherwise freeze it or expose it to a lot of chemicals. I think you can put it in alcohol, but then that's not something that you're going to be mailing. So um, the last few people that I've talked to that submitted ticks for testing, I said, just put it in an envelope or put it in a Ziploc bag, put it in an envelope and mail it so that it gets there pretty quick, uh, intact, right? They're gonna do a better job testing with much more accurate results if it's intact and it, and it hasn't been adulterated in some way. Great questions. So that is my last slide for this. I am happy to stick around for anyone that wishes to stick around. If you have any more questions, um, I will say sort of as a wrap up that the initial talk that I gave, which was a needs assessment based talk years ago, where uh, it was with a volunteer naturalist group working with um, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, they they had asked for more um, uh, information so that they could protect themselves when they were gonna go out in the woods. And since that initial talk, uh, it's absolutely exploded in terms of the asks that I get uh, to provide updates on where we're at with ticks and where the diseases are at and how we can protect ourselves. Um, and in, in it's a very valuable um, knowledge uh, and content um, you know, provided service for your clients. So if you 
uh, are looking to build a, a set of data or resources, you are welcome to contact me. My email that I can bop into the chat box right now, I think will be in your follow-up email tomorrow, but you're welcome to contact me. I'll um, point you where I get a lot of my information. Uh, they have a, a National Asian Longhorn Tick Working Group that has a lot of folks that does updates monthly and uh, the information that I got for you is pretty much as up to date as can be because that is one that we really want to watch as it goes forward because some of the diseases that the Asian longhorn tick vectors, especially to people over in its normal host range, um, can be pretty devastating. And we really need more people talking about ticks and, and increasing the public uh, health awareness and doing research on where uh, we're at with tick diseases right now. Uh, Mary asks, clients persist in being chemical phobic and want a natural organic pesticide, any reliable ones? Um, so potentially, yes, Mary, I know that there are uh, a number of different um, studies that are out there that are looking at some of the natural oils uh, from like cedar or other things out there. Um, I don't have a specific product to share with you, but but that's where I would look is I would um, see a lot of the products that are used right now that are um, effective repellents, not the insecticides because permethrin is already a synthetic. Uh, it is the synthetic derivative from the um, pyrethrum, which is the organic component of that. Uh, but we're seeing, a, we're seeing some growth in that. We just need to have the research to make sure it works. There's a lot of products that uh, make the claims that they work, um, but you know, given that you have uh, such a potential devastating um, sequelae from disease vectored from that, uh, I, once we get some great research on what uh, organic oils and things that are out there that work, then I will gladly work those into my, um, in there. So Elizabeth Barnes would like to answer this question live. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Oops, sorry, I, I clicked the wrong thing. Just, all right. you did a great job answering it, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we got a bunch in the chat. Um, thank you. Thank you both. For the allergy, is it only mammal-based food or is it other animal products like fur or wool? So that is a great question, Elizabeth. So first off, it is non-primate mammalian muscle, but they are seeing uh, some dairy in there as well. And there are a number of products that are made out like some gelatin products and some other uh, different things that they are concerned that might cause that allergy as well. So it's not just um, the meat. I've seen some articles that indicate that some of the other products that come out of non-primate mammals, um, if they have that alpha-gal carbohydrate in uh, them that is similar to what's in the saliva and you have that allergy, especially if you have a, a much worse case of it, because as with all kind of allergies, um, it, it's really individual to the person. Immune systems are funny things that way. Um, but yes, there are uh, some worries about some of the non-meat as well. Thanks, Tom. My pleasure. If we do it in 2021, it'll probably be completely different. Well, not completely different, but we'll throw all the updates in there. Hopefully, we're not talking about further spread, further invasive, or any new ticks coming. All right. Um, if nobody has any more questions, um, I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, we will, just a reminder, we will send out an email shortly with uh, contact details for the speaker as well as information about how to get your CEUs. Um, thank you so much for doing this talk. We really appreciate it. There's a lot of great information here. Um, if you are interested in any of our other webinars, check out the Emerald Ashbor University website. Um, and with that, thank you for joining us and have a great week. Thank you all.